to shift gears a little bit now and probably talk about some stuff that that uh, <clears throat> some of you know better or maybe have seen some of this uh, deer stone work that we've been doing. Uh, I've been doing that uh, as a partnership with the National Museum of Mongolia and with John Rungshav of uh, Han for many years. Ho uh, Chihuyuk actually uh, began my association with the museum back in 2001 and two and introduced me uh, at the end of the, I guess 2002 or three to Lars Khan, who was a, a young guy uh, just uh, taking a position at the end of the museum. And Ho uh, Chihuyuk said, well, here's the guy who's gonna really make your life <laughs> happy and, and uh, productive, and he was certainly right. Firesick on has turned out to be a wonderful curator of the museum, a tremendous uh, archaeologist, and has been uh, working collaboratively with many different groups uh, across the world who are working in Mongolia. So he's, uh, he's done great work, and recently uh, they've been getting into Stratfire work, uh, sort of. Been, Christine was just talking about in some of the northern, uh, northern habitation sites, which is going to be producing some really a lot of fun, a lot of good data. So uh, let's see. So the late Bronze Age uh, culture of deerstone, uh, deerstone herbs are complex, uh, persists over several hundred years with little change in ritual art and architecture. This paper presents uh, evidence for regional cultural and chronological variation in deerstone art and ceremonial activity based on research there at two sites, at Yadag and Zumigol, and a few others in north central Mongolia. Yadag uh, displays a new class of miniature deer stones and evidence of proper smelting. And at Zumigol, an unusual herixer uh, is associated with deer stone, with a deer stone carrying elements of Scythian Saka animal style art not found in on other deer stones uh, in northern Mongolia. Uh, deer stones are found across the grassy steppes between the Gobi Desert and the forested mountains of northern Mongolia. Outliers exist in uh, southern Russia, Kazakhstan, and Xinjiang. Most are concentrated around the Hongai Mountains in central Mongolia. The trail of deer stones with attenuated markings extends to the shores of the Black Sea and the plains of eastern Europe, but none are found in eastern Mongolia. Deer stones were first described by the Russian archaeologist uh, B.B. Radloff in 1892 and were studied by Soviet archaeologists, including Oplatnikov, Dinkov, Volkov, Rodova, Kubarov, Savinov, and, and others. Volkov's uh, 1981 monograph titled Deer Stones of Mongolia became the Bible for all subsequent work. The big questions were what, when, what do they represent, and how old are they? When excavations revealed no bodies or artifacts associated with deer stones, researchers turned to typological studies of the weapons on the deer stones to date uh, the, the stones and their art. Archaeologists proposed a variety of theories about their function, the ancestors, warriors, fertility, figures, gods, shamans, or vehicles for shamanic flight. Perhaps the deer image represented the mythic deer goddess uh, of Siberia, popularized by uh, Esther Jacobson. Volkov uh, classified deer stones in three types, all of which have a square or rectangular cross sections that were erected facing east, probably so that the individual greeted the rising sun. All of has had head, torso, and waist areas. Arms and legs are never shown. Two or three diagonal slashes indicate a face. Circles to either side represent earrings. A grooved line indicates a necklace, and a groove or band stands for the warrior's belt. Deer stones with these minimal features are called Eurasian deer stones, according to Volkov's typology, and we still pretty much use that today, uh, and have been found from central Mongolia through Western Asia. Eurasian deer stones do not have images of deer or other animals. 
Cyan Altai deer stones are found in the mountains of northern and western Mongolia. They add animals to the core features noted above. Carvings may include the iconic deer motif, the horses, moose, pigs, felines, and even fish. Deer are usually shown with legs extended, and tools are shown floating on the torso with no belt attachments. These features seem to indicate a latent period in the deer stone chronology. Classic Mongolian or Mongolian deer stones occur in the rich pasture lands of north central Mongolia. They face, uh, the face may have two or three slashes. And if the face area is polished, it may, it probably was painted. In rare instances, fully modeled faces are present. Other ornaments include a beaded necklace, ornamented earring hoops, sometimes with smaller secondary circle, suggesting the earring and the small circle are a sun and a moon, Sim simple, symbolically. The torso shows deer with legs tucked beneath their bodies rather than extended. A pronounced withers peak, scrolling wave-like antlers, pointed ears, and two forward projected brow ties that are not uh, features of the Eurasian deer, but actually of the reindeer. The torso shows um, uh, the body and antlers are those of the Siberian maral, or red deer, Cervus elapis sibiricus, while the forward brow ties suggest uh, reindeer. Instead of, a, instead of a deer's head, there's the rounded head of a bird. I think I'm behind, behind my pictures. Okay. That's the, I'm sorry, this is the Volkhoff uh, classification. <clears throat> so the classic Mongolian is the most ornate, as you see. Uh, the Sain Altai has animals, but it's a much simpler form, and the Eurasian deer, deer stone has only those minimal features, and this is the stone that turns up on the, on the black sea. The Eurasian's looking really lazy, no? <laughs> <laughs> much less to work. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't show up. Okay. This image may appear singly, but usually is packed together with identical images, belly to back, often wrapping around four sides of the stone. The flat sides are, are uh, made, uh, made the carving visible as shadow effects, although most of these images were probably painted. A disc shape shaped shaman mirror is on the stone's east or front side. You can see that up here in the middle, down by the belt, that brown black suit. Uh, hanging from the belt are weapons such as a bow, quiver, axe, dagger, pick, knife, chariot, rain hook, sword, and others. The rear or west side of the stone shows a pentagonal battle shield seen earlier today. Uh, with chevron marks. Some of these emblems have only a few chevron stripes, while others have more than a dozen. Viewed broadly, the markings on deer stones carry a triadic message. Military leader, shamanic clairvoyance, and magical protection. The latter endowed by a master deer, bird, deity of land and sky. So actually, the, the uh, deer stones are are, the deer image itself is a composite number of animals, but important to the deer. Uh, no less intriguing to Soviet experts were the stone hyraxors found near deer stones. Hyraxors are a special type of barren mound, surrounded by a fence like uh, ring or by a square arrangement of stones. Uh, each of the small mounds around the east side of the fence contain an east-facing horse head, seven neck vertebra, and four hoofs. Here is one of those circle features that are found around the outsides of the hericsers and around the uh, deer stones on the east side. Uh, beyond the horse mounds are small circular rings with charcoal and burnt animal bones. That's what we see here. Um, uh, 
Pyrexers have a single human burial in a shallow pit in the center, but these remains are rarely preserved. So around the, you know, you have two different types of features around the, the Pyrexers. On the east side, you have horse mounds, and around usually the west side, you have these circle mounds. In 2001, curiosity about a, a possible Bronze Age Mongolian connection with the, with the old Bering Sea culture uh, led me to team up with the Mongolian National Museum to begin a new round of deer stone studies using tools like radio carbon dating, laser scanning, settlement pattern analysis, and a less artifact centered excavation strategy. For 10 years, we retraced Volkov's deer stone trail across Mongolia, making discoveries that revived deer stone studies and established the deer stone Erikser complex as the foundation for subsequent horse-based stem empires and artistic traditions. Our finds have been published this year in their books on deer stone art by my Mongolian partner, Bayer Saikan, and my book on deer stone archaeology and ceremonialism. And the publisher of these books is sitting here on in front of you, Peter Bittenthal, who has uh, used to work for Dartmouth Press and started his own business and has been doing a wonderful job publishing literature, including mine, uh, did a, a very beautiful job on this work. He was great to work with. And he won't even crack a smile or say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Freed from a, a fixation on artifacts, uh, excavations around deer stones. <laughs> Is there some reason this doesn't like it? Okay. Freed from a fixation on artifacts, excavations around deer stones found each surrounded by small mounds containing the horse heads and small circular paths with burned animal remains. We imagined these constructions as memorial sending rituals for departed leaders who received offerings of sacrificed horses, while families gathered around the small paths uh, and offered flesh and smoke offerings of sheep, goats, and large animals. Identical horse mounds and paras are found around Herixers. Together, deer stones and Herixers comprise the mortuary ceremonialism of late Bronze Age culture. Radiocarbon dating provided a surprise. Our excavations produced a consistent chronology of 1300 to 700 calibrated BC with little stylistic change in the deer image or the architecture of deer stones or Herixers. Dates from both deer stones and Herixers showed that deer stones, deer stone art begins 500 years before Pazur and 500 to 1,000 years before full-blown Scythian Saka nomadic style art, which you see down here. This is the uh, Scythian type of art. These are the Eric's first classic Mongolian of the South between Sign Alpine Deer Stone Days and Eurasian Days. You can see that the Eurasian Days are getting very close to the Sakin Days. Okay? The central theme in deer stone studies has been the flowing Scythian-like image of the deer. What exactly is this creature, and what did it stand for? Why was it a deer? Why is it a, a deer bird composite? How is it related to other Central Asian art styles? The leaping or, or flying deer bird image and occasional appearance of drums invoke thoughts of shamanistic flight while stone torsos covered with the iconic deer image remind one of Asian tradition of decorating or protecting the body, rather, with spiritual armor, form of tattoos or ritualized clothing.
that's not let me go back. Anyway, what I what the slide that is missing is an illustration of belt patterns, which shows that the belts are uh, designed with incredibly uh, diff. Oh. Can you go back one? Oh, how, did, how did you do that? Oh, magic. <laughs> yeah, there we are. So these are some of the different styles. Uh, of, but you see how, it, how incredibly different those belt patterns are. They're all, they're all uh, probably were woven belts, very similar to later style belt, warrior belt pattern, belt, the design of belts, which goes down through the ages, relatively recent times. E.A. Novgorodova uh, provided clues about beerstone function. Her studies of tool types and belt patterns revealed a variety of forms with little duplication across hundreds of beerstones. The diversity of personal equipment contrasts with the unchanging or iconic image of the beer, whose form was dictated by religious convention. Instead, tool and belt patterns suggest they illustrate a specific warrior whose name, weapons, and belt designs would have been recognized. Just some quick pictures. Yeah. Huh? Oh. Well, it's great having a lot of help. Oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm touching Yeah, you're touching the same. Um, further, further person, personalization is suggested by polished face panels, which almost certainly carry painted portraits of real individuals. Considering the tattooed warriors from the frozen Khazar tombs of the Russian Altai excavated by Rudenko and Kirajanov, it seems likely the deer stone images report tattoos, uh, tattoos on deer stone uh, warriors and leaders. Now we're going back. Yeah, yeah, they're on. Yeah, they're way. Oh, I brought one. <laughs> so. This <laughs> okay, um, this is, of course, the famous uh, guy from the uh, throws the tombs. Uh, if deer stones represent real people, their settings may record biographical lineages within deer stones culture. Where multiple deer stones are present in a single site, they are installed a few meters apart in the north-south line. Bushkin over has three such lines. Two lines with six deer stones and the three with, uh, and the third with three. Other sites commonly have four to eight stones in a linear setting. Might the settings represent a chronological succession of regional leaders with different rows representing different clans, perhaps? Such a biographical history before written records is a unique feature of Bronze Age Mongolia. If our interpretation is correct, Mongolian deer stones represents a who's who or biographical dictionary of hundreds of Mongolian Bronze Age leaders. To my knowledge, no such statuary history has ever been created elsewhere. Uh, new research has also illuminated symbolic aspects of Beerstone Eric's ritual architecture and provides insight into its function. Russian archaeologists speculated that the, rad the, the radial lines extending from the Altaian mounds, not so much the Mongolian, but the Altaian mounds, to their encircling stone fences resemble spoked chariot wheels. Researchers now presume that the sacrificed horses in the small mounds around the east side of the Herixer fences served as steeds, propelling the Herixer and its honored guest eastward into the afterlife. Perhaps this is why, perhaps, uh, perhaps this is why chariots and rock art images of the Mongolian deer are often found near Herixums. Horse sacrifices around deer stones probably serve a similar function, drawing the deceased leader into the afterlife. 
Beerstones and Herxers appear in southern Russia and north central Mongolia around 1300 BC. Between 700 to 600 BC, uh, 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 Herxer culture, Beerstone Herxer culture in central Mongolia is replaced by a westward advancing slab grave slab grave culture, uh, and in the Mongolian Altai is replaced by Khazar. By 6 to 400 BC, Eurasian deer stones appear in a broad swath of territory from central Mongolia to southern Russia and the Pontic region. Knowledge of, Western, of the western spread of deer stones is restricted by a lack of radiocarbon dates and archaeological context in Western Asia where they are associated with the burial mounds and Scythian leaders in the centuries after Deerstone Harrison's culture disappears in Mongolia. If the, west, uh, if the east to west model is valid, we should expect later days and stylistic differences in Harrison's uh, ritual in the Altai regions paired with central Mongolia. Such differences do exist. West Mongolian Harrison's show a near absence of horse sacrifices they have slightly different architecture, spoke radials, and often have deer stones embedded within the deer stone, within the Herx or mounds, features that are absent in central Mongolia. Deer stones display similar regional variations. West Mongolia has fewer classic types, utilize softer rocks, carvings are less well executed. The distinctions suggest westward shift of the deer stone Herx or culture from the horse ridge. Mongolian heartlands to the more mountainous and drier Altai environment. Excavation at Yadag East shows evidence of the Bronze to Iron Age transition. Here we found a series of miniature Eurasian type deer stones alongside classic Mongolian types that have Scythian style coiled feline images associated with copper slag dated 400 to 200 BC 80. <coughs> It appears that this site was occupied toward the end of the Deerstone period <clears throat> when Scythian Pazaric influences reached in central Mongolia. Another shift seen in the Deerstone arm is the replacement of the iconic deer image with moose or by horses, which during the Deerstone period had become central to the, to the economy, trade, and power structure of the Deerstone heresy culture. <clears throat> A unique deer stone from the site of Zunigo provides another clue to the Bronze Age uh, transition. This site has many deer stones of Eryxers that conform to the standard deer, deer, DSK uh, deer stone Eryxer pattern. <clears throat> However, one deer stone and Eryxer differ from the others. Deer stone 10 has an ibis bill bird on the face area on one side and a frog on the tip on the reverse. It shows diminished emphasis of, of Mongolian deer, has no warrior belt or weapons, and its necklace has a boar's tooth rather than a bee's. Most unusual is the depiction of, of predator prey activity, including felines and a wolf attacking a boar and bobbin. These features depart from the static formulaic composition of the classic Mongolian deer stone and present a more active confrontational narrative style of Indo-Iranian, Hazaric, and sitho saka art. The presence of quivers suggests the importance of hunting. The mirror evokes shamanistic prognostication, and the boar's tooth, frog, ibis, and Mongolian deer suggests the use of animal spirits for protection and hunting success in the afterlife. The Zunigo stone combines elements of Mongolian and Saka, uh, Sion, oh, sorry, combines elements of the Mongolian and Sion Altai deer stones with a more energetic narrative style of early nomadic art, <clears throat> suggesting a transition from Bronze Age uh, DSK beliefs into a new Iron Age world. Fortunately, we have no radiocarbon dates for deer stone 10 or its, or its atypical Erickson, but we believe they were created toward the end of the deer stone era around 5 to 6 BC. Question. Uh, yeah. Some of these, uh, uh, I guess, designs, so maybe with the belts, I, it kind of reminds me of some of the last game, we have that kind of results. We maybe have similarities or comparisons, like totem poles or, you know, 
Yeah. 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 That 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 parallel has been made more with uh, some of the Shang and Zhou art in China, uh, more so than the Deer Stone. This this is thing. But uh, there are not a lot of. Um, I wouldn't. I haven't. I'm I'm kind of. Uh, I'm very prone to making long-range connections in, in archaeology, and I've done that in the North Pacific area between you know, Siberian cultures and Alaskan cultures. But this, to me, lies outside the place of parallels, and I don't see anything in that. Although we do see one of one of the similarities is that, that this combination of the different animals into a single image is something that does occur in the Alaskan art. So you have you have a carving that will be looking like a wolf at one end and a killer whale on the other. So and, they, and they, there are traditional stories about wolves that go to the edge of the ice and then become killer whales. So, so you know do we have that that uh, spiritual transformation concept that is true? That that is that is certainly a connection of some sort, but not so much in the graphic arts as far as I can see. The breakdown of the rural, of the ritual-dominated, centralized order of deerstone culture uh, <clears throat> ushers in a new phase of cultural development in which smaller groups and polities predominate across Central Asia before the emergence of centralized states and empires. And here is getting to that connection. Uh, the search for Asian links to early Eskimo art and its themes of animal transformation Shamanic ritual and early metal acquisition routines. <clears throat> early nomadic art and frozen all time burials provide clues for old Bering Sea and Indian type cultures in Alaska. And genomic connections uh, dating only a few hundred years later than past. Uh, progress will be difficult until archaeological work advances in Northeastern Asia. <clears throat> so I do think there are some, uh, some similarities, but they're very general. And in particular, you know, dealing with the animal, animal imagery, and I think that probably uh, it's uh, shamanism is one of the basic uh, conveyors of those of those kind of connections. Because shamans are so important in this Eastern Asia as well as in, into Alaska. Uh, and I think here's here's Byra. I just wanted to thank my co Byra, my co-partner, uh, for being such a wonderful colleague. And, 15 or almost now 20 years of collaboration. So uh, that's that's the new Stone story, and you can follow it if you're interested in the book. And then in the book, uh, in my book, anyway, but Byra's book is, uh, we, we kind of organize them with Peter as a pair. So Byra is, Byra's is his thesis, and it's basically a study of your Stone art in a very, very detailed way. It's uh, certainly the most comprehensive study ever done of, of Deerstone art and its connections to ethnography, you know, comparisons with other places you know, in, in Eastern Asia and so forth. My book is more a book about the archaeology that we did dealing with, uh, with the sites, uh, with some of the art, uh, with the connections, and it's paired with a lot of uh, ethnographic information from people we met uh, as we went along to work. So you know, we were always bumping into folks who were tremendous about uh, genius insights about how they lived, how the, how the climate was changing, how their animals are doing, and you know, how their milk was fermenting, <laughs> and, and doing, uh, giving us cheese, and, and uh, as well as lots of information. They did not have any information about the deer stones themselves. They, they were pretty mystified by the symbolism they called the they called them our stone men. They really had no idea, except that they were very old and they represented our ancestors. So they were very interested in the archaeological work that we were doing. One of the, when we, when we would find things, they would get very interested. We, we spent a lot of time digging horse heads because the horse heads were the connecting tissue between the deer stones and the herrick roots. And they were the way that we were able to date all these sites by extracting uh, teeth from the horses and radiocarbonate the teeth. And 
once in a while we would find a really beautifully preserved horse head. Uh, and one time we were going to sample, uh, we were going to bury it, we were going to leave it, come back the next morning and finish excavating. The buyer said, you better, we better take the canines out of the horse, uh, out of the horse jaw because tomorrow is now then. And the, the herders are going to come back and they're going to grab those canines because they just, uh, they, they were talking among themselves as they watched us dig it. That must be a very special horse to be buried 3,000 years ago. And if it's a very special horse, it probably was a very vast horse. They wanted the canines as charms for the not a racist tomorrow. So yeah, we, we, took, the, uh, we took the canines. <laughs> We came back and the burial wasn't this terrible. But, uh, anyway, that's the, uh, that was the story. Of you you showed us three different categories of Jewish stone stain. Mongolian, stain, and Eurasian. Yeah. So Eurasian, it'd be more like the ones that spy the Black Sea. Yeah. yeah. They're the simpler stones, and it seems that there is some kind of a westward movement. Uh, you know, and, uh, at the same time, there's that Western movement going on, the Slab grave culture. It's coming, it's moving east into the Deerstone area in the, in the northern part of the East. Mm -hmm. and see, it seems almost like there's some kind of pressure moving the Deerstone uh, culture further west and eventually reaching the Black Sea. And some of those Deerstones are. But you can see, like, it's like in Mongolia, yeah. it, it, by the Black Sea, you see nothing much in the midfield. No. Right. No. It's, uh, it's no, I mean, uh, is it a rapid migration or what happened? Because, uh, you know, that's true. There's, there's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. And some, and, and the deer stones around the Black Sea are, are very clearly related to the deer stone Mongolian tradition. They have the, they have the belt, they have the necklace, they have slashes on the face, they have round earrings and so forth. So very definitely it's, it's coming out of that tradition. Furthest west that they ever get is up into Eastern Europe in Sindhu stones there. Unfortunately, the archaeology that was done on those Pontic Scythian graves and the, the deer stones that were there was done 100 years ago and not very well done, so we have almost no, you know, we have no dates. We have, all we have is Scythian, you know, dates on the Scythian sites. We don't know when they, they exist. But what we would really like to know is exactly what is the date of the deer stones. Regions. Yes. So it's an idea that uh, went a very long way. And it's a pattern that just continued in the, uh, in the Turkic period, you know, 700 AD, and then again the Mongolian period, Empire period, that western, that big western world. Deer stones don't go very far north, you know, they don't go into much of the Baikal, uh, a little bit over the border, but they don't, they don't spread, unlike Mongolian pressure, which spread up into, into Sata region and carried horses and horse culture and so forth way up there. This does not happen. So, um, do you think those are the contemporary? Yeah. So, yeah, they, they sure are, because they had the exact same ritual with these facing horse heads and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Initially, a lot of the archaeologists in Mongolia thought they were separate cultures, different time periods. Yeah. But they're, they're the same culture. Is that, I just want to say, um, yes, the deer stone culture is going to if I'm not mistaken, the mystication happened, right? Well, they already have horses, they had sheep and goats. The deer stuff culture is basically the modern culture of the Mongol They had all, all the domestic animals. Hey, the building can fit I just wanted to relate really quickly. Right now. Um, you want to shut the doors there? Uh, yeah. The, uh, the connection that was pointed to the Americas, I mean, this is totally a long shot, but it's uh, just, it struck me as interesting that there's actually much further south in, in the Andes, there's a nearly contemporaneous tradition, um, a very conceptually similar tradition of creating these standing stones or composite animals. Um, 
and like sort of in a transformation state that are size I just thought it was an interesting phenomenon. Well, yeah, standing stones are pretty, there are a lot of traditions with standing stones. I mean, look at Megalus and Mira, and so on, there's a lot of fun there as well. Uh, I, I come from a Department of Anthropology that had Cliff Evans and Megalus talking about Ecuadorian connections with uh, Baldivian connections with uh, John Mullen and so forth. Uh, um, but I, you know, I'd be interested to see some of these and see what they look like. Yeah, I mean, maybe just kind of a, like a sort of shamanic um, phenomenon that happens across cultures, yeah. but it is interesting. There's a deer there's stone in Virginia. <laughs> Somebody showed me a picture of it, and, uh, but it, you know, I could tell it was made recently. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for uh, for an uh, interesting session this morning and your yeah. questions. Uh, uh, I enjoyed having you all here and appreciate it. So the pretty much the conclusion is that Mongolian stones are the best. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>